So welcome to the last uh, series of talks. And uh, our first invited speaker is uh, Shri, Dr. Sri Han. She's a research scientist at the Agency for Science, Technology, and Research in Singapore. And uh, her current work focuses on how experience affects sensory perception, how this knowledge can be translated into applications. All right, so let's welcome our speaker. Hello, everybody. I know it's very late, so I'll keep it short. So um, to give you a bit of a background motivation about why I do the work I do, I just let you down history at the lane, history lane for a while. So I did a lot of my PhD work dealing with endocrine suppression. And then I started getting interested in the idea of sensory experience and design because our conscious experience actually affects how we enjoy design. So methods and you know, applications and therapy. So that's how I got into this. So for this talk, I'm going to focus only on interocular suppression, which in my view is a very versatile tool that allows the easy manipulation of visual awareness. And the reason why is because it involves bistability that allows you to experience an alternating per step every two seconds. So just a brief introduction of endocular suppression. There are those who know what it is, just bear with me. So input presented to one eye under endocular suppression, it actually suppresses the um, irreconcilable input in the other eye for a few seconds. And there are examples like binocular rivalry. So one eye sees the red grating and one eye sees the blue grating. And the first step is a series of alternations between the blue and red grating. And then here, uh, over here, it's a GIF, or GIF, however you want to pronounce it, of a simulated experience of binocular rivalry. And then another form of interocular suppression is continuous flash suppression. I think Sean presented his study using the Mondrian. So it's basically basic idea you have a target in one eye, be it a word or a grating or a face or image, and then you have a mon uh, high contrast monitor in the other eye. So basically how it feels like in CFS, this is simulated by the way, is that you have this very high contrast grading and then at some point you will see your target. So because this long period of um, suppression from awareness, of people use it to uh, examine things like unconscious visual processes. So. There are some criticisms about endocular suppression in the vision science community, but I like to look at criticisms as opportunities. So let's go through these criticisms. I mean, two of the criticisms. So the first criticism, people, because I work in an uh, institute where I come across a lot of industry partners, and one thing they always complain about studies that use endocular suppression is that hey, this thing is like not found in the world, so why do I care about this? So, and then the other complaint that people have about intraocular suppression within the vision science community itself is that the results are difficult to replicate and then people don't really understand how the method works. So, let's go through the first criticism. Is bribery or intraocular suppression a lab artifact. We first need to ask ourselves, do we experience incompatible inputs to each eye in the real world? So, some ways we can experience incompatible inputs are monocular occlusion with the pirate cat we see here, or when we intentionally look through a telescope or close one eye, we get incompatible inputs. But the more common ones that we get are partial occlusions because objects in the world, they occlude each other because we all exist in different layers. So this is how incompatible inputs can be generated. And I'm going to focus on partial occlusion because it seems like more likely because not many of us go around looking like a pirate or holding a tissue um, cardboard going on like this. So let's focus on partial occlusion. Okay. So when we start to think about partial occlusion, right? Um, one question that pops up is that is the presence or the knowledge that we are in 3D space 
the geometry of the treat space actually suspends the alternation of awareness. So we can test this in virtual reality because the nice thing about virtual reality is that everything looks sharp at all distances. So you can be you can test just geometry and exclude other instances like blur. And we got participants to track um, their percept for like a couple of minutes for three different types of geometry conditions. So in the first kind, which is what laboratory intraocular suppression usually does, is that you have two incompatible images occurring at the same depth. So if you have a monitor, use a stereoscope, they're on the same depth. And the second kind, semi-possible, is where there is some distance between the two stimulus. And this is kind of like when we put an object in front of our eye intentionally. So it's semi-possible because it can happen, but we don't go around like this all the time. And plausible is for the partial occlusion condition, where you see more of one object in one eye compared to the other. Now, just give an idea how it looks like in VR. So in the impossible condition, one eye sees a different orientation from the other, and they are in the same orientation, I mean, same location. And we got them to track exclusive process. What I mean is, we can see a clear orientation and not like having any influence on the other orientation. And then for the plausible version, this is an example of partial occlusion. So one eye um, sees the front object and the other eye sees something more from the background. Same thing, we get them to track uh, exclusive process. And what we find is that when you when you just introduce depth separation, you don't actually do anything to experience of uh, the bistability in rivalry. And even if you put it in a partial occlusion condition, you still see these alternations. So these alternations can occur even with naturalistic geometry. So our question is, is it a lack of occurrence? Maybe it can occur, but it just doesn't occur enough. So therefore, it is not something we experience in our conscious ex our daily conscious experience. So one thing we can do is we can create a 3D model where we have a stereo camera, and then we can put objects, two different objects at different distances and lateral displacement. To make things easy, we just color code them green and red so that any disparity or incompatibility will come out as yellow when you do the subtraction of the images. And anyway, main point is after we did this computation, run it through the uh, fusional limits, we find that um, incompatible inputs are still not as rare as we thought it would be. In, the, in a simple 3D model. So in regards to the first criticism of using such techniques to study visual awareness or any other kind of study, uh, aspect you are interested in, it is, not, it is not not valid because we do experience rivalry and we can experience rivalry in the real world. But then why don't we experience it from our daily lives? Easy, look into literature, attention, and there's a, because when things are closer, they are more blurred in the real world, and there is blur suppression going on. And so rivalry, in a way, contributes to mechanisms that promote coherent visual experience of the world. Also, given modern technology, there are relevant real world situations for rivalry and other bistable phenomena. Take a look at uh, smart glasses. So these are coming, whether we like it or not. So smart glasses, um, this, 
inputs are not going to always be the same as the inputs from the other eye. And so such situations are always going to occur. So studying and using intraocular suppression is externally valid, not just because we can experience it and we can find it in the naturalistic geometry, but also we, because modern technology has created situations where we will experience this. And so it creates opportunities for us to ask questions about attention, rivalry, and you know, detection in such situations. Now, okay, now the next part is a bit, a little bit dry, I hope you fall asleep. <laughs> okay, so now that we deal with the first criticism, let's go back to the second criticism about intraocular suppression techniques. So that criticism is that, okay, the results are mixed and we don't actually know how it works. So let's take the case study of continuous flash suppression. So if you, that's just to recall, it is basically this uh, phenomenon where one eye gets a flashing quadrant mass and the other guy gets a target. Okay, so there are studies that uh, have shown that low level properties affect the um, amount of time a target remains suppressed and also work that question how we measure unconscious pressure processing under CFS. And these two come hand in hand. And this is why. So for example, some low level CFS mechanisms that has been discussed is stimulus fractionation. So the idea that a stimulus uh, image that's under CFS is broken into parts and not integrated. And any result could be uh, a case of a low level property gaining, you know, being more salient and, and then gaining awareness. And then there's also the idea of like, because the representation is fractionated, uh, suppression can be stimulus feature specific. So you need to have like for like mass to make sure that the target is properly suppressed. And there's also the issue that with intraocular suppression, like CFS, that the strength of suppression decreases with prolonged exposure. So if you if you are thinking of presenting CFS for like, I don't know, like half an hour or, or four minutes in a block, it might get weaker and weaker and it might be harder and harder to render your stimulus unconscious. So how is it related to measures? So uh, one of the measures within the CFS literature is called breaking CFS. The basic idea is you uh, measure the amount of time for a stimulus to gain visual awareness. So there, there are some discussion that these breakthrough times are insufficient to gauge a, a differential unconscious processing. So one of the reasons people complain about is, oh, maybe because the stimulus is fractionated, you're just seeing like the bright parts of the eyes, you don't actually see the face. Then, um, then some people they try to control for this by having a non-vibrous control. And then the opposition was saying like, oh, but then rivalry, I mean, CFS have a variability in suppression times um, such that for very long suppression periods, people might have addition, different decision criteria. And then they showed this by um, either presenting the control and the CFS condition in blocks or interleaving them and showing that the difference in um, reaction time actually changes between the control and the CFS condition. So, and one of my uh, PhD advice, I'm PhD advisor, um, they recently introduced this new method for for uh, CFS, instead of just measuring the breakthrough times, you also can measure the, the um, uh, uh, you can also measure the contrast um, reduction of the target for it to be suppressed again. So there are different different methods and uh, for, for, and measures to to counter some of these criticisms. But uh, the, the main thing is that people are still concerned about low level properties and stuff within the vision science community. So as a solution, 
because there was the pandemic and there was a lockdown and we were bored at home. We created an app, it's open source, you can use it, it's free, don't have to pay money. <laughs> um, it allows users to create any kind of mask they want, customize it, analyze your target and mask to deal with some of these uh, criticisms. And also uh, just to run through, so this is the home page. Usually I will run the app uh, you know, live, but this is not happening today. I apologize for that. <laughs> so this is the screenshot of this. So you just need to update your input, your screen refresh rate, the viewing distance, and then there are four modules here. So creation is just to create the mask and it looks like this when you click on creation. You can have pattern elements, um, which could be like circle, square, diamond. You can have a solid view or you can have a noise view, depending on what you want to do. You can, if you want, you can have a object as a element of a mask. So these are the kind of five different kinds of things you can get just from the creation itself. And then if you use customize, you can further control the properties that a reviewer or someone might be you know, complaining about. So for analysis, um, if you click on the module, you can add your mask, your target, and then uh, select some of the um, properties you want to analyze like age detection, color, basic color analysis, because you know color analysis is much more involved. And then you can get uh, analysis results. So this is for the uh, spatial frequency and temporal frequency content of the mask. And this is like the color analysis. So we just spit out the hue, saturation, and value results. So the results are like um, presented like a, what you call it, gel electrophoresis. So the more dark bands, there's more of that content. And yeah, and it is available on GitHub, on my friend's GitHub, because my GitHub is exploding. And you can just go to this QR code to access it. The accompany paper, which is like a manual, you can also go to that and then follow. Any questions come to us, because we, um, from what I know, I think someone is going to convert this into a site toolbox each kind of package. So the current one is point and click. So it's very good for you to like do a quick try. But when you want to do like proper experiments, you wait for that one, or you could use this one to like, do experiments. And yes, so in sum, what I want to say basically is that techniques that use intraocular suppression, they do have external validity. So if someone says a funder or someone complains about it, it's like, no, you can see it and I'll show you why. <laughs> and then, um, and also, uh, we also created this crafter for uh, people to deal with. Like if you have concerns about low level compounds <laughs> or you have someone complaining a paper at low level compounds, you can always use this free app to test it out. And besides from testing it out and making controls, um, I would like to like invite the audience to like think about further users of it, because I thought about it and I haven't thought about more. But so let's more hits together be better. So one thing you could do is can we use uh, things like that to quantify the amount of interference from the mass, and then can we use it to you know start understanding the processes involved when we're dealing with fractionated or subliminal information and perhaps model it. And with that, I want to thank all my collaborators and you. I think that's it. Also, I want to uh, ask a question. <laughs> so I am not a hardworking student, so I wonder that, uh, is there literature tell us that, is there um, the pattern of the manager will interact with the stimulus expressed or which kind of manager is better? Yes, there is a review uh, by these this people. And I mean, the most paper just basically say this fractionated, but uh, there, this is uh, 
this people, the scientists, researchers have provided a nice review. But there's also a lot of literature that I I, I know what you mean. But they 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 do um, provide some recommendations. You can also we also provide recommendations with the crafters paper. So so you could check those out. Hi, and thanks for the talk. And I'm always very curious about how do you guys define what is speed in the grassroots CFS paradigm? Since it, it looks like um, when the uh, contrast increase, the percent is like from the no percent to a uh, little bit degrade, degraded stimuli to the full stimuli, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems that there's a period of time is actually heavily influenced by the, our metacognitive criteria, right? Yes, yes. So how, how do you instruct your participant to build a relatively stable criteria in their mind? And of course, across participants, like to use this criteria to say what is colors mean uh, seen. Um, there are a few uh, different ways you could do that. So for me, I usually measure contrast thresholds. So I actually just change the target contrast and then uh, run the staircase and then get when they uh, which contrast do they see targets? I also do do breaking CFS, but usually I get them to report the quadrant or something more objective about the target itself because seeing and not seeing is a bit, um, is a, it's probably a little bit more prone to biases and decisional criteria. Mm -hmm. So you could ask like objective questions about like the target, like what orientation, stuff like that. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so with that, let's thank Dr. Pao again. Thank you. All right, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Xiaopu Khan, and he is a doc postdoc uh, research scholar at the Institute of European and American Studies at Academia Seneca here in Taiwan. His work primarily uh, focuses on epistemology and the philosophy of mind. It's widely thought that as far as conscious ex experience are concerned, there is an asymmetry between self-knowledge and knowledge of others. We can know our experiences in a way unavailable to others. For example, I seem to have a special way of knowing that I'm hungry, I see a tomato, and thinking about food, and so on. Of course, you can also know these things, maybe by observing what I do or what I say. In any case, it seems that you cannot know these things in the way I do. The topic of my talk today is this specialness of self-knowledge of consciousness. My main goal is to present a puzzle about it. I'll start with some preliminary clarifications, and then I'll present a puzzle. The first clarification is about consciousness. Consciousness, I mean, what Ned Block calls phenomenal consciousness. Very roughly, your mental state is phenomenally conscious, just in case there is something it is like for you to be in it. Examples of phenomenally conscious states include perceptual experiences, bodily sensations, emotions, and so on. The second clarification is about specialness. By specialness, I mean what Alex Byrne calls peculiar access. Very roughly, you have peculiar access to your mental states just in case you have a special way of knowing your mental states, which others cannot use to know your mental states. Notice that to say that self-knowledge is peculiar in Burns' sense does not entail that self-knowledge is epistemically superior to knowledge of others. All right, let's now turn to a puzzle. The puzzle is about the specialness of self-knowledge of consciousness. It consists of three independently plausible but jointly inconsistent claims. The first claim is about the basis 
of sessions. The fact that we can know our experiences in a way unavailable to others doesn't seem to be a brute fact. It seems to be grounded in something more fundamental. If so, in virtue of what can we know our experiences in a way unavailable to others? The natural thought is that the asymmetry between self-knowledge and knowledge of others is grounded in a parallel asymmetry. On this view, we can know our experiences in a way unavailable to others because we can bear a special relation, whatever that is, to our experiences, such that others cannot bear that relation to our experiences. This is the first claim, and let's call it special relation. The next two claims are about the potential case of shared consciousness. So let me present a case first. The two girls you see are conjoint twins. On your left is Tatiana Hogan, and on your right is Krista Hogan. The twins are very special. They are craniopagus twins. That means they are joint at head. What's even more unique is that they are joint at the thalamus. There's a piece of neural tissue that connects to each twin's thalamus, which has been called a thalamic bridge. Information in each twin's brain can cross the bridge to the other twin's brain. And most importantly, due to their very special neural connection, stimulation of each twin's body can cause the other twin to have experiences. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporations made two documentaries about the twins. The films well capture their behavior and interaction, but since time is limited, I'm not going to play the films. Instead, I will just tell you two most relevant events. The first incident is about touch. Both twins seem to be able to correctly report where the other twin's body is being touched with their eyes covered. So, for example, at one point in the 2014 documentary, when their doctor touches Tatiana's left foot, Krista not only correctly reports where the doctor is touching with her eyes covered, she also reports, I can feel that. So it seems reasonable to think that when your doctor touches Tatiana's left foot, Krista also has a tactile experience. The second instance is about pain. Both twins seem to be able to build pain in the other twins' body. For example, at one point in the 2017 documentary, while they are visiting some place, Krista reports, I have a headache. Immediately afterwards, Tatiana reports, my sister has a headache. But when asked about it later by the interviewer, who gets the headache, you or Krista? Tatiana replies, both of us, it's like big. So it seems reasonable to think that when Tatiana reports, my sister has a headache, Tatiana not only observes Krista's behavior, Tatiana herself also feels the pain in Krista's head. All right, let's now turn to the second claim. The second claim is about how to interpret the twins' case. Tom Popper thinks that they share experiences. More precisely, his view is that the Hogan twins can simultaneously have numerically the same experiences while being distinct subjects. This is the second claim. Let's call it sharing. To better understand the sharing thesis, let me make two clarifications. First, when the twins share an experience, they don't have the same overall phenomenology. Rather, the situation could be seen as some sort of phenomenal or that. So take the case of touch. When their doctor touches Tatiana's left foot, they have the same tactile experience. 
but since they look in different directions, their visual phenomenology differs. As a result, their overall phenomenology also differs. The next clarification is that the twins never report that what it's like to have a shared experience is very different from what it's like to have an unshared one. While more, much more evidence is needed, I suspect that the phenomenology of a shared experience does not tell them that it is shared. It's not as if a shared experience comes with a label indicating that it is shared. I don't think that's the case. They need more information to tell whether an experience is shared or not. Now, Cartman himself thinks that the twins are most likely to share hints. He reasons as follows. First, here's a claim about the neural correlates of consciousness, according to which if experiences E1 and E2 have numerically the same neural correlates, then E1 is E2. Second, since each stage of pan processing occur prior to and including the thalamus, and the twins connect at their thalamine, where information in each twin's brain can cross the bridge to the other twin's brain. Pan processing that occurs in one twin's brain can serve as the neural correlates of both twin spans. It follows from the first claim that the twins can have the same pains. Okay, let's now turn to the third claim. The third claim is about the implications of the twins' case for specialists. The next thought is that if the twins have the same experiences, then they must know their experiences in exactly the same way. I think this is too quick. I think it would take, if we look at the case more carefully, we will see that even if the Hogan twins share experiences, each can know that she has the experiences in a way unavailable to, to the other. This is the third claim. Let's call it asymmetry despite sharing. More precisely, my view is that even if the twins share experiences, each can have immediate knowledge that she has the experiences, but each can only have inferential knowledge that the other has the experiences. Now, the distinction between immediate and inferential knowledge is very important for me, so let me explain it. Following prior, I will say that you have immediate justification to believe P, just in case you have justification to believe P, and you do so in a way that does not depend on your having justification to believe any other proposition. By contrast, you have inferential justification to believe P, just in case you have justification to believe P, and you do so in a way that depends on your having justification to believe some other proposition. So to see the difference, consider the following case. Suppose you have operator's pain. In this situation, you arguably have immediate justification to believe that you're in pain because you have justification to believe this proposition. And you do so in a way that does not depend on your having justification for any other belief. By contrast, you arguably only have inferential justification to believe that you have operator's pain because Although you have justification to believe this proposition, your justification depends in part on your justification for some other belief, such as the belief that your pain is from arthritis rather than something else. All right, going back to the third claim. Why is it that even if the twins share experiences, each can have immediate knowledge that she has the experiences? but each can only have inferential knowledge that the other has the experiences. Let me explain with the headache case. For the sake of argument, I will assume that the headache case is a case of shared consciousness. That means the pain crystal feels in her head is the pain content of feels in crystal's head. Now, 
since Tatiana feels the pain, Tatiana has justification to believe I'm in pain. And I take it that her justification here is like no subject. Her justification is immediate. And I also take it that Tatiana has justification to believe her son is in pain. The question is whether her justification here is immediate or inferential. And my view is that her justification is inferential because her justification depends in part on her background belief about how the pains are connected. So given her past experiences, she's likely to have the following background belief. Normally, if one twin feels a pain in the body part, then the other twin feels a pain in that body part too. Now, the background belief like Lin here plays a crucial mediating role. One Tatiana's justification to believe Link is the defeated, her justification to believe Krista is in pain will also be defeated, but not vice versa. If Tatiana gains evidence, say that their pains are no longer linked, such that often one is in pain without the other being in pain, then her justification to believe Link will be defeated. And so where her justification to believe Krista is in pain. By contrast, even if Tatiana's justification to believe Krista is in pain is defeated, say, by posing testimony from Krista, that need not defeat her justification to believe Lin. So, in short, even if the pain Krista feels in her head is the pain Tatiana feels in Krista's head, Tatiana can have immediate knowledge that she's in pain, but she can only have inferential knowledge that Krista is in pain. And the same goes for Krista. So in short, even if they share a pain, each can know that she's in pain in a way unavailable to the other. Now that we have seen the three claims, let me briefly explain why the three claims are jointly inconsistent. So in a nutshell, the three claims are jointly inconsistent because what they seem to entail are jointly inconsistent. The first claim is that we can know our experiences in a way unavailable to others because we can bear a special relation, whatever that is, to our experiences, such that others cannot bear that relation to our experiences. That seems to entail that each twin can know their shared experiences in a way unavailable to the other twin, because each twin can bear a special relation to their shared experiences, such that the other twin cannot be a that relation to their shared experiences. So that's called the part before because A and the part after because B. So the first claim seems to entail A because B. The second claim says the Hogan twins can simultaneously have numerically the same experiences while B is in the subjects. This seems to entail that it's not the case that each can have their special relation to their shared experiences such that the other twin not be in that relation to their shared experiences. And let's call this not be. The sharing thesis seems to entail not be because when they share experiences, no matter what relation one can bear to their shared experiences, and no matter how special that relation is, the other can bear the same relation to their shared experiences, precisely because the experiences are shared. Finally, the third claim says, even if the Hogan twins share experiences, each can know that she has the experiences in a way unavailable to the other. This seems to entail that each twin can know their shared experiences in a way unavailable to the other two. And that is the A claim we just saw. So to put it in schematic way, the first claim seems to entail A because B, the second claim seems to entail not B, and the final claim seems to entail A. So the three claims are jointly inconsistent because what they seem to entail are jointly inconsistent. You cannot hold A because B, not B, A at the same time. Either one of the three claims is false or one of the three entailments doesn't hold. In any case, something must go, but what? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. That was very entertaining. I really enjoyed it. Um, so um, it seems to me that the puzzle depends on an, an ambiguity 
um, of the notion of experience. So when you say that um, an experience can be shared, uh, it seems to me that you're identifying experience with um, like something like pain, the object of the experience. Whereas uh, when we talk about experiences, um, one way to think about it, especially um, how people in phenomenology think to, uh, tend to think about experience is in terms of um, experience being involving both um, the conscious act and an, uh, and an object or a content. And if you, if you make that separation, it seems to me that you can share experiences in terms of objects, but you cannot share experiences in terms of act plus, plus object. You can have the same object, but you can't have the same conscious act at the same time. And it seems to me that you can dissolve the uh, puzzle that way. What do you think? I think, I see. So that's, that's one way to, uh, so the way you suggest to solve the puzzle is to deny claim two by saying that the sharing thesis doesn't hold. And my reply is that I try not to take a position on the question of the nature of experience, whether it is whether we should analyze it in terms of act content or attitude content or something like that. But I think um, my my immediate reaction to your suggestion is why why don't they share that act? What why why is there any reason to think that they not only so they only share the object of experience but not the act? Why why do you think that? Why what reason? Uh, is there any reason that prevents them from sharing the act rather than just an option of experience? Is there an argument for that? Uh, I, I don't have an easy answer, but um, I, yeah, I think it's a good question. I'll, 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 I, mean, I mean, isn't the answer something that you had said before, which is, I mean, their eyes are looking in different directions. I mean, they're, you know, I, I mean, they don't have a single, you know, they don't have a single brain. Their eyes are pointing in different directions, so they're going to be different okay. entities, right? Of course. So uh, I say that it's it's best to think of uh, their situation is best seen as some sort of phenomenal overlap. I'm not saying that they have the same overall phenomenology. That that seems plainly impossible. I'm saying that they only share. Uh, part of the overall phenomenon. They only share the part that they share. So in this case, they only share tactile phenomenology. They don't share the overall phenomenology. And in the pain case, they only share the pain phenomenology. But the other part of the phenomenology, they don't share. Otherwise, they would be one and the same subject. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would repeat the previous objection, and I think you've just undermined your own answer to that objection, because really, uh, Phil and I can look at this microphone and we share part of the phenomenology, but we don't see we're the same people, I think. But your argument there just said that we would be the same people, because we're sharing part of the phenomenology. It's the whole experience that matters. So anyway, my... my uh, uh, question and just thinking out loud and more just for fun was what what role do you see the biological nature of the bridge playing in your argument so it seems that to me that if we change the example a little bit to someone stuck a transmitter in Phil's head and, you know someone punched him in the head and it was wired up to me I, I would feel it but you probably wouldn't make the same argument that we were the same person so is the biological nature of the connection fundamental to your argument? Or do you think that your argument would work if we had an artificial connection? Yeah, so the reason why I focus on this real world case rather than conducting a thought experiment is that so in discussion about personal identity, there are lots of uh, thought experiments. Uh, they so there are philosophers saying that, uh, yeah, people can connect in crazy ways. And they usually, when they talk about this, they don't get any empirical support for their hypothesis. But um, that's, not a, that's not the direction I want to go. I want to uh, ground my discussion on empirical 
finding. So that's one, one of the reasons why I choose this case. But it should be noted that at this stage, the evidence for the sharing hypothesis is far from conclusive. So the twins are very young. They there have been no control studies of the twins yet. So most evidence comes from newspaper articles and documentaries and things like that. So I think there is much, much, much work to do in order to prove that they really share experiences in the sense that Cochrane suggests. So my strategy here, so with, uh, I didn't talk about my preferred strategy to solve the puzzle, but the strategy I prefer is to grant the three claims. I grant that they can share experiences and I grant that special relation is true. And I myself argue for the third claim. My strategy is to grant the three claims and try to show that the second entailment doesn't hold. So my strategy is to say that even if they share experiences, each can bear a special relation to their uh, shared experiences in a way that the other three cannot. I try to show that. I understand why you'd want to do that strategy, but my, my point is precisely about Cochrane's definition. So I think that your choice of example might potentially lead to lack of clarity about how that definition would be applied to in this case. Um, so you're saying that there's a neural, uh, the, the neural uh, correlates are identical, therefore the experience is identical. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, it sounds a little strange for a neuroscientist, but I think the, the biological nature of the connection might be leading to misspecified uh, idea of what exactly a neural correlate is in this case. So you're saying that you try to, um, you're trying to say that the first principle is false. So you're saying that uh, if experiences E1 and E2 have numerically the same neural correlate, there are cases where the uh, antecedent is satisfied, but the consequent is not. There are cases like that. I'm from a uh, biological point of view. <laughs> I'm going entirely from an empirical point of view here. Okay. Right. I'm going to have to stop you guys right here. So, uh, for the beginning of time, so I think we have to move on to the next uh, speaker. But uh, let's thank Dr. Khan again for the end of the time. All right. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Tsuling Liu. Uh, she is from the Visual Cognition Lab from the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at National Central University here in Taiwan. Uh, she uses EEG and non-invasive brain stimulation to study brain mechanisms of visual awareness and as well as uh, emotion perception. So uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Liu. Uh, thank you all for organizing this uh, amazing conference. I really enjoyed the conference this in this two days. So today I'm going to share uh, uh, the, the recent works of our team uh, in the past two or three years. Um, okay. So today, basically, because I'm, um, my topics, I'm not really familiar with the consciousness science. So. Uh, my, at that time, when I decided to do this uh, presentation, I, I tell myself that my goal is just to share our experience in the brain stimulation techniques, and maybe, if possible, maybe we can persuade you that uh, using this kind of non-invasive stimulation technique can be a method that we, when we do uh, like consciousness study. So uh, we know that the brain is actually a decoder because the brain, for example, when you see a light, the brain doesn't really see. And what I mean, say, not seeing, means that the brain itself does not receive the photos from the environment. So what does brain do? The, the brain, actually, it is a bunch of neurons under our skull. And uh, his job is to you know, decode the electric signals from the nerves and transfer it somehow into our perception. So to know the code book of the brain seems to be quite important for us to understand 
where does our perception come from? Uh, one of the most famous uh, study is the Nobel Prize winning study done by uh, Hibbon Whistle that they created uh, the uh, map on the visual cortex by systematically uh, uh, recording the single neural activities. And also following this, we will also believe that maybe we can create some uh, artificial visual experience if we know the correct code of our brains. So what kind of uh, artificial visual experience that we can create? One of the examples is the false thing. So what is the false thing? False thing is basically defined as the light perception that you see something flashing in front of your eyes when there's actually no light. Okay, and something actually has a very long history. It is uh, maybe uh, in the earlier times reported by the ancient Greek uh, and also in maybe uh, in 1920s, uh, the uh, doctors has uh, implanted the small electric in a blind people's uh, visual cortex and give them very uh, weak electric stimulation and the patient reported seeing some flashing light in front of them. So in our study, we try to use the Boston paradigm to study what kind of information can be picked up uh, by our brain and generate our perception. And actually, we are not the first one to do this kind of study in 2008, uh, Dr. Kameni and his colleagues has already tried to apply the uh, uh, weak uh, tra uh, transcranial alternating current on the occipital part of the, the subject. And the subject report that they see something flashing there. And they found that uh, the sensitivity, the sensitive or the threshold can change uh, according to the frequency that they align with the alternating current. And the uh, most sensitive most sensitive uh, bed area can also change according to the light, uh, lighting environment. So at this point, we start to know that uh, our perception system seems to be quite sensitive to some um, oscillatory properties like the environment or like the uh, oscillation frequency. So in our lab, we concerns about, we have a question about how the brain encodes the information from the environment and how this information can affect our perception. And for the first, uh, for the past decades, people start to notice that sometimes the brain does not transfer or deliver information in a linear way. Uh, in fact, the brain sometimes delivers this information in a form called amplitude modulation. So what is amplitude modulation? Amplitude modulation is actually a form of cross-frequency coupling. That means two oscillation uh, that they couple together in some way. So uh, amplitude modulation is that you have a kind of sort of carrier wave relating there. And now the amplitude of this carrier is modulated by the phase of another analog wave. So Mathematically, when you uh, multiply these two waves together, you've got the amplitude modulated wave like this. So you see the, the fast oscillation, uh, the amplitude of the fast oscillation is somehow modulated. Sometimes it's big, sometimes small by the envelope. It's following the, the, uh, the, how say, the location or the phase of the envelope wave. So actually, previous studies have told us that our visual system somehow take this kind of format to deliver some information. For example, in this study, they found that the retinal ganglion cell can correctly decode the light information if you give them the information in an amplitude modulated format like this. So they transfer the, the brightness information into amplitude modulated signals and deliver it in an electric shot to the retinal cell. And Basically, the retinal cell can do a very similar response. And in our lab, we also try to use EEG to see how does our visual cortex encode this kind of flashing. We use the flashing LED to simulate, uh, to stimul uh, to simulate the subject and found that if we show the subject the sinusoidal oscillations and you observe the similar oscillation in 
uh, over there on sitting on Congress. This phenomenon is called the uh, steady state, it uh, visually involves potential SSVP. So we use another kind of waveform that is amplitude modulated to simulate this object and we find that basically your visual cortex can encode this kind of information quite well. So uh, our following the next step is so our brain can do this, but do our perception also pick up the ends uh, information? So today we're going to answer a uh, few questions here. The first one is, of course, does the AM can affect the TACS induced false preset? And second is, if yes, then how? What might be the possible uh, mechanism underlying that? And the third, we try to uh, ask the question that um, is oscillation per se sufficient to generate a phosphine? Okay, so in the first experiment, we simulate this option in the occipital uh, area. This is like the study done in 2008. But the different things that we generate on top, different uh, waveforms that we use uh, four frequency, uh, four carrier frequencies to, to pair with two different amplitude modulating frequency. So you see, we can generate all different kinds of simulation. And then in the task, we simulate the subject for eight seconds and ask the subject to use the mouse to mark the areas that they think is flashing in their visual field. Then uh, the interesting part is that we add another grateful task that we give them a flashing bar, a box here in the Middle of the in the center of the screen, and the subject can drag. They can they can drag the bar here to adjust the flashing speed of the square. And the instruction was that we ask them to adjust the flashing speed of this square and try to reproduce the flashing that they saw in their false speed. So with this method, we can somehow measure uh, how fast the subject think the the false speed is flashing. So the result here, the first we can see the threshold intensity. So this blue line in uh, represents the uh, fresh intensity of the sinusoidal simulation. That means there's no amplitude modulation. And basically, we found a very similar uh, phenomenon like Dr. Kami that the um, most sensitivity area falls around the 20 hertz. And if we add a two hertz and two modulation, then you see the fresh intensity rise. And if we add a four hertz amplitude modulation, the fresh will uh, even rise more. And the second part is the flashing rating. That means how fast the, the phosphine is flashing. And firstly, we draw this linear this is line here to represent the linear function that if the subject are like machines can correctly detect the given frequency. Okay, so for the sinusoidal simulation, basically you see subjects are quite uh, correct, uh, except that when the flashing is too fast, sometimes they cannot detect it. But basically, this line here can be explained by uh, this, this linear function. And if you add a 4 hertz uh, AM, uh, AM amplitude modulation, then you see the rating drops a little. And if you add a 2 hertz amplitude modulation, you see the line goes very flat that the carrier frequency does not have any, have any effect here, and basically the ratings are quite low. Okay, so uh, from, this, uh, from this result, we can make a, a interesting conclusion here is that this A energy modulation of the PACS induced phosphine percept. The answer is yes, and basically it increased the threshold and decreased the flashing percept. So we ask the second question, if yes, then what might be the potential mechanism? If we compare these two, uh, the Samsung with the AM uh, waveforms, then first we found that, yeah, they are different in shape. But why is the different in shape may have an effect in percent? Then we have to go back to the neural mechanism of the uh, TACS, the transcranial current uh, simulation. So when there is no electric stimulation, basically we still have some intrinsic neural firing there. But if we add an 
uh, alternating current here, then you'll see basically the current, it can adjust the tendency of neuron firing. So the neurons will tend to fire in the same time, but not in other. So the TACS, the TACS basically bring up the effect that the, uh, the cells will uh, fire synchronously. So it creates a synchronous firing in our cortical, cortical neurons, right? So if we look back to our result, we find that, oh, somehow our data seems to reflect the frequency of given, given our simulation. So the possibility is that the flashing ray we perceive may reflect the neural alignment, that is the synchronous firing may align to the simulation frequency. But this is the, uh, this is the situation in the sinusoidal, then why do we have this kind of flat effect here? So what happened in the AMTACS condition? So we just formed because the, it's in the beginning, so we just form a very simple hypothesis, is that there's two possibilities. One is that the neural uh, alignment is aligning to the carrier frequency anyway, so that the carrier domain hypothesis. And in another situation, is that our perception only pick up the envelope information, for example, the two hertz or four hertz, and ignore the fast oscillations. So uh, from our data, Actually, we cannot differentiate these two because if this dashed line here is the perception threshold, then you see the AN carrier, the, although the area carrier still cannot reach to the uh, threshold every time. So last reaching, so it reaches the threshold last frequently and you see a slower flash that makes sense. And if the, uh, if the perception system is envelope dominant, you also see the uh, slower oscillation because it only catch a low frequency stimulation. So what can we do is that we try, maybe we can try to add to um, make the stimulation stronger. We add a, we add a super threshold stimulation. So in this carrier dominant situation, if I in increase the amplitude of the oscillation, maybe they will see a a more peaks that can surpass the threshold and see a faster flashing. But for the envelope dominant hypothesis, it seems to be not much difference. So under this hypothesis, we'll try to see that if we add a super threshold stimulation in the carrier dominant hypothesis, you'll see a super threshold is faster than the threshold stimulation. But if it starts for the Level dominant hypothesis, then no matter how you increase the intensity, you always see the flashing is close to the uh, amplitude modulating frequency. So, this is the first part. And we go, go to the third question is that is, is the uh, oscillation itself is sufficient to produce uh, phosphine? We know that TAC is the, the transcranial uh, alternating current, that means it switch between the positive and negative polarities. So actually at this time it has two components. One is the polarity switch and another is that the current oscillates all the time. So uh, but actually we know that if we just give a you know a flat line which we call the uh, transcranial direct current simulation, basically the software will not report any force So we think Oscillating, the oscillating current can be the key component of generating phosphine percepts. So to uh, test to test this idea, we add uh, another kind of stimulation technique here is the uh, oscillatory transmitted direct current uh, stimulation, which is OTDCS, so I say o OTDCS later. And the another OTDCS means the oscillation always happens in the uh, positive side. And the Kazala OTDCS means uh, the oscillation happens on the interactive side. So we can test that without polarity switch, whether the OTDCS can still induce the phosphine precepts, and if they do, whether the positive or negative has an effect on the perception. Okay. So 
So the experiment is experiment two is quite similar to experiment one, though there is something different. The first one is that we generate only six kind of simulation that we use the fixed carrier frequency and fixed uh, AM frequency. But we use another uh, another two. We created two other simulation. One is another OTPCS and another OTPCS. And here, uh, another different here is that we add a condition in the super threshold that we try to verify whether the carry or the AM frequency is more dominant. And the task is very similar, and they also still have to rate the uh, uh, flashing speed here, but also we add some other subjective ratings. Uh, but I thought just because of time, I'm, I, will not, I may not be able to report that today. So let's go into the first part, the threshold. And firstly, you can see that um, the threshold intensity in the sinusoidal simulation, there's no uh, difference between different kinds of simulation, but the subject, basically, they can see phosphine no matter which kind of simulation. And here we see the amplitude modulated uh, condition, like the first experiment. We still have a higher threshold here. So it basically re uh, replicate our previous study. We also measure the response time. The death line in indicates the threshold, uh, threshold intensity simulation. So you can see that with higher uh, threshold, uh, the subject usually responds slower. And if we increase the stimulation intensity to 100, 120%, that is a super fresh, uh, super fresh stimulation, then you see their response time significantly uh, become faster. There is a, a small difference between the Kabbalah OTTCS and TACS, but other comparison was not uh, significant. So uh, at this point, I think we can answer this a third question that is, is the oscillation itself is sufficient for the phosphine per set? The answer is yes. The current oscillation can induce phosphine regardless of the polarity. And also we notice that the phosphine threshold is not affected by the current polarity, so suggesting that the relative potential change uh, rather than polarity is uh, more crucial for generating phosphine per set. And we go into another result is the flashing rate, the subject rate, how fast the, the flashing is. And you see, again, we replicate our pre uh, previous find findings that the amplitude modulated simulation are much lower than the sinusoidal uh, simulation, no matter in what kind of simulation. But interestingly, uh, the interesting thing is that if we uh, Increase the simulation intensity, then we got interaction here. That uh, for the uh, Casado OTPCS and TACS, there is nothing really different between the uh, threshold or super threshold simulation. But you see in the end, the another simulation, another OTPCS simulation, increasing the uh, simulation intensity will make the subject see a faster flashing there. So if we want to go back to see our previous the simple hypothesis there, we can see that in the attitude modulating condition, uh, the OTPCS, the Kazal OTPCS and TACS seems are not, they were not uh, significantly affected by the uh, simulation intensity. So somehow they uh, seems to support the envelope dominant hypothesis. But for the anodal, uh, OTVCS because we add a, because we increase the uh, intensity and we see a fast rating. So it seems to support the carrier dominant uh, hypothesis. So there are kind of a separate result here. So to answer our question, what might be the potential mechanism under AM effect? We think that envelope uh, information seems to be more dominant, especially in the TACS or consolidated. OTVCS, but not in the another OTVCS. However, uh, uh, we have been we are still uh, studying this result that we think uh, changing the cortical excitability may change the subject, uh, subjective percept. Okay. So to conclude the oscillation, well, I hope I can persuade you that the oscillatory TS technique can be a good tool 
to study the visual awareness because it has a kind of wealth control parameters. And the second one is the fostering flash seems to suggest the dominance of amplitude modulation, but uh, I think the mechanism can be quite complex and we need more study there. And third, that is uh, the third conclusion is that our results seems to suggest a more alignment to the envelope information or the AM information could be important on lighting our uh, perception formation. And our ongoing work are actually working on we are working on this is that the mechanism under the flash rate, whether the flash rate per set is a competition or com combination between uh, the carrier and AM frequency, or we'll do more on this. And the second is that we are using the EEG to try to analyze whether this kind of rating, the subjective ratings are, are related to the subject intrinsic uh, brand oscillation. Okay, thank you for your thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, nice talk. So I'm just curious that it seems that our visual system should have a different sensitivity to different uh, AM frequency. So in other words, there should be an optimal AM frequency that can activate the, the visual system. So uh, I'm curious that, are you using the optimal AM frequency? And if not, if you change a different, if you pick a different range of AM frequency, do you think you're gonna get similar results or maybe opposite results? Uh, yes, I think there is optimal range. Actually, before the first experiment, we run, uh, we ran a pilot study and used a two hertz, four hertz, and eight hertz AM frequency. And basically the, the report, the record rate is quite low after higher than four hertz. And subject, it almost cannot report any false thing at like eight hertz AM. Okay. Right. Let's take our speaker again. Thank you.